The government will definitely not tolerate those groups who are after the destruction of public properties or disrupting the public order or sparking riots in our society. Our people will not tolerate it either. If I were President Trump, I would uh, have a nationwide address pretty soon explaining uh, why the Iranian nuclear deal is a bad deal for the world, what a better deal would look like, and urge Congress and the European allies to get a better deal with Iran uh, before it's too late. You just can't tweet here. You have to lay out a plan. And, of course, we are looking at the Iran protests that have erupted in recent days. Let's bring in our panel, Tom Rogan, commentary writer for The Washington Examiner, Mara Eliason, national political correspondent of National Public Radio, and Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. Ladies, gentlemen, Happy New Year. To you. Happy New Year to you. Molly, your read on the Iranian protests? Well, it has just been quite dramatic to follow this news over the last couple of days. I think it shows us that contrary to what people have been saying about Iran being a regime that is very unified or the country being unified and everybody is emboldened by their shared hatred of Donald Trump, that you actually have at least a large contingent that is not pleased with Iran. They aren't pleased with their foreign intervention. They're very upset with the corruption of the regime and the economic, the bad economic effects of that. And so whether regime change is likely is, is a, a huge question. I don't think it's likely, but this is still a dramatic turn of events. No surprise, President Trump turned to Twitter to talk about the protests that we are seeing. Let's take a look at that. Iran is failing at every level despite the terrible deal made with them by the Obama administration. The great Iranian people have been repressed for many years. They are hungry for food and for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. And no surprise, former Ambassador Susan Rice of the Obama administration had a very different view. She was tweeting, how can Trump help Iran's protesters be quiet? Mara, you've covered both administrations. Your thoughts on well, what we're seeing? President Obama was more restrained than President Trump because his administration believed that if he showed too much support for the protesters, it would backfire and the regime would paint them as a kind of American puppet movement. Donald Trump doesn't feel that way. He's going out much stronger in favor of them. But as Lindsey Graham says, you've got to have a strategy. Does this mean that he should reimpose sanctions on Iran? Remember, he decertified the deal, but he didn't, and Congress hasn't at least reimposed sanctions. So what does he do next? That's the big question. How does he support these protests? Because there have been protests in the past during the Obama administration, and they didn't go anywhere. Tom, your thoughts on what he does next? Well, I think the, the most obvious thing he can do is to try as much as possible uh, to keep Wi-Fi networks in operation. The Iranians are really putting bigger steps in shutting citywide. The U.S. has the capability to, to provide some measure of relief there. At the same time, I think there's an opportunity in the portfolio of the Iran nuclear deal to make the case to the Europeans, uh, to embarrass them on the international human rights concerns, which they talk a lot about, and say, listen, the nature of this regime, why don't we go back to the drawing board, as they are trying to do at the moment in getting ballistic missile, um, counterpoints into the deal, uh, more vigorous inspections at military sites. Why don't we restructure this so that there is more of a moral concern about where the sanctions relief money goes, that it doesn't go to Lebanese Hezbollah and missiles into Riyadh, that it might go to a private, you know, an, a European or American company in private and private public partnership uh, with an Iranian company that isn't linked to the Revolutionary Guards. That's very in the weeds, but, but there are functional opportunities here. And I think Trump, quite frankly, is right to, to make that case on Twitter, the moral case, food and freedom, uh, because, you know, there's a lot of arrogance from the Obama people say, oh, we have to stay quiet. We were so important, Obama's words. This is a domestic Iranian thing that will flow on the merits of public. Po it's worth remembering, too, that the Obama administration wasn't just quiet because they thought that it would be helpful to the protesters. In fact, they didn't want to be helpful to the protesters. Everything was subverted to the overarching Obama administration goal of getting that Iran nuclear deal. And that included, you know, as we learned in recent days, uh, not investigating the Hezbollah operation fully, where they deliver millions of dollars of cocaine to Europe and the United States. But everything, because the Obama administration believed that the, um, the mullahs were going to be in power for a long time and that they kind of placed their bets with them. And they find this moment probably very embarrassing because uh, this, this type of unrest is contrary to the narrative that they have sold and that has been carried by a lot of media outlets, too. No surprise. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has a strong opinion about what's going on on the streets of Iran. Let's take a listen to him. This regime tries desperately to sow hate between us, but they won't succeed. And when this regime finally falls, and one day it will, Iranians and Israelis will be great friends once again.
I wish the Iranian people success in their noble quest for freedom. Tomorrow, obviously, for the Israelis, the best possible scenario would be something dumping the regime oh, sure. in Iran to avoid a military conflict. Sure, but the question again is, what is the best thing that Israel and the United States can do to make that happen? Donald Trump was very clear in that treat, tweet. He wanted regime change, time for change. So what, hap what can the U.S. and the Israelis do to make sure that happens? It, we've been for regime change for a very long time. There have been protests in the past. And we haven't gotten what we wanted. Uh, you know, and I do think. Look, no, I, I think it would be crazy to, uh, you know, talk about going to war with Iran to try and sort of use a, a secondary front with the protesters. But that basic demographic level, Netanyahu is right. Whatever Israeli political interest there, um, in the sense that you have a very young, angry population who has not seen the dividends of the promise that, and the narrative of the Islamic Republic is one of liberation and shared sacrifice and a kind of nice socialist utopia, and the reality on the ground. Uh, is suffering. And, and, and again, I think that is something the United States in that economic level to reform things so that money flows to people on the ground. The big problem is this ultimately the regime will collapse because the people, the hardliners, how many, um, you know, the IRGC, their, their doctrine is a mission from God. They will not yield. Um, and it, it'll take a flip in the security forces. At uh, some point, that will happen. And calling out evil and unjust regimes is actually an okay thing to do. I mean, yeah. people mocked President Reagan when he called the Soviet Union an evil empire, but this is a, this is a, it, and particularly when it aligns with your nation's interests. And in this case, you know, Iran is the number one sponsor of state terror. It's a nuclear threshold. They're causing all sorts of problems in the region. So it, it's okay to call them out. 